So uh, thank you everyone for logging on. Uh, this is the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. This is actually the last lecture of the 2022-2023 uh, academic year. So on behalf of Dr. Rubesh and myself, we'd really like to thank um, the chairs of the committee, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Statuta, as well as the entire committee, uh, as well as support from the Education and Fellowship Committees. Uh, this is a labor of love for those of you who don't really know how the, the sausage is made, so to speak. This really starts uh, way in advance of planning. And in fact, the 23-24 uh, committee, uh, which is being chaired by Dr. Robbie Bowers from Emory and James Robinson, the HSS, uh, they have already started meeting and planning topics and speakers. So for anybody who's logged on who's currently a fellow or trainee um, or anyone who's researching, if you have some suggestions, you are more than welcome to email uh, any of us, um, and we can forward on your suggestions of speakers or topics that maybe we didn't get to this year. So as a reminder, this series is really to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming, and to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with top AMSM members in a variety of formats. And as uh, pertaining specifically to the topic tonight is to assist in the CAQ examination preparation. Um, if you would please mute your device's microphone, however you're watching tonight, you can submit questions to the chat function, including your name and program, if you wish. Um, the moderator tonight will be Dr. Rubish and myself, so you can ask us questions uh, when we get to Q&A. Um, and after the program, uh, Andy Meyer will send out an evaluation, which will be available on AMSM Collaborate. So tonight's topic is the sports medicine CAQ, what to expect and how to prepare. It's my honor to speak alongside not only one of MSM's uh, well-known members, but also really one of my best friends in sports medicine, Dr. Melody Rubesh. Dr. Rubesh is the medical director for Broadway and works at Rothman in New York City. Uh, my name is Jason Zaremski. I work at the University of Florida. Um, I also uh, already took my research last year, so I'll be able to answer a few questions on that and recently took the exam again one year ago, and I did pass. So uh, what we're going to do is this is really kind of the nuts and bolts, the logistics of the exam. We're not going to go over specifics about is chocolate milk good as a post-race, you know, hydration drink or, or what is the best, you know, type of eccentric versus concentric physical therapy. The point of tonight is the is the bones of the exam itself, because I feel like that's something that has been missing in the past. And I think that'd be helpful for the last talk of the year. So as a reminder, the Certificate of Added Qualification Sports Medicine is really offered in conjunction with the American Board of Emergency Medicine, Internal Medicine, PEDS, and Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. The CAQ became available for qualifying family physicians in 1933. It's designed to recognize excellence among diplomats who practice, emphasizes expertise in sports medicine, the field itself. Now, uh, for any of you who are internal medicine trained, you can still and you are still eligible to take the CAQ. It's not offered by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Um, sorry, it is offered by the American Board of Internal Medicine, but there's a little caveat that changed. But otherwise, every one of us that have primary certification in these five specialties are eligible. So if you take a look, and this probably feels like I'm your parent telling you what to do, but if you are anticipating taking this in July, you probably should have already signed up. This was the deadline. I'm going to skip this slide because if you have uh, not done this yet, you're probably not going to be eligible to uh, take the test. But if you're planning to take the test in the fall or November, here is the timeline. Again, this comes off the American Board of Family Medicine website, and we list some of the links there uh, below. But uh, remember, the first deadline to submit your application is August 21st. So if you're planning on taking the exam in November and not this summer or in a couple of weeks, I should say, this is a timeline you should be paying attention to. The cost, um, always a cost. The initial attempt, uh, so if you're taking it after graduating from fellowship, is $1,300. And a reattempt after an unsuccessful attempt, which hopefully none of you will have to experience, is $650. And then you have a uh, one other caveat if you have greater than two unsuccessful attempts. There is a caveat with this. This is coming through the American Board of Family Medicine. Each primary specialty has a slightly different cost for varying reasons. This is for the family medicine folks. And for any information, uh, here is the are the links that I was able to find. The link is below. 
Uh, the phone number is a national number and the email is help at the abfm.org. Uh, and then you can see the, the times that if anyone has any questions about it can call in. You will take the test at a Prometrics center. Uh, and then I'm going to do this slide and we'll switch over to Dr. Rubesh. But this is this is basically how the exam works. We know it. I think a lot of you probably know it's 200 questions at this point. You're going to show up. You're going to do your registration, your ID, your scene. You've done this before for likely your board examinations uh, prior, whether in, in MD or DO qualifying examinations. And basically you have a block of 100 questions and you get up to two hours. You can take all that time. You can finish it however quickly you feel comfortable doing that. There is an optional scheduled break for 15 minutes, and then you have your second bank of 100 questions. That does not mean you're going to take four hours to finish this test, but you do indeed have four hours to take it if you so choose. And lastly, uh, everyone always asks us, it takes about six to eight weeks, uh, typically from the last day of the examination window. So I think there's four or five days of testing, and the reason it takes this long is to score it uh, but also see if there's any questions that need to be thrown out as well. Dr. Rubesh, you are next, and just let me know when you want me to move the slides. Yeah, so essentially, we're trying to just help you figure out how to work smarter, not harder. There's definitely so much you have to know to be a good team physician. They can't take, they can't ask you everything. So you want to make sure you're focusing on the areas that there's going to be the most questions. Know that there's going to be exercise as an essential component of health throughout life. These are not just going to be questions about team, being a team physician. There is, however, medical management and supervision of recreational and competitive athletes, including all others who exercise. So I call them weekend warriors or civilians, those types of things. Um, an exercise for prevention and treatment of disease and injury. Go ahead, Jason. So specific content areas, focus on these when you're studying physiology, biomechanics of exercise, basic nutrition principles and their applications to exercise, psycholog phys <laughs> psychological aspects of exercise performance and competition, guidelines for evaluation prior to participation in exercise. So is somebody cleared to exercise, uh, physical conditioning requirements for various activities, pathology and pathophysiology of illness and injury as it relates to exercise, we're going to go into some of these in a little more detail later. Effects of disease on exercise and the use of exercise in the area of medical problems. Prevention, evaluation, management, and rehabilitation of injuries. So when you see these types of topics when you're studying, definitely highlight them and keep an eye on, out for that. Understanding pharmacology and the effects of therapeutic performance enhancing and recreational drugs. Promotion of fit, physical fitness and healthy lifestyles functioning as a team physician, and ethical principles as applied to exercise and sport. So let's get into that in a little more detail. Anatomy, no body parts with groupings and compartments. So rotator cuff muscles, wrist, lower leg compartments, quadrilateral space borders. They love to ask those types of defining anatomy questions. Nerve pathways, brachial plexus. That's a great way to get a couple layers of questions in, right? You ask one question and they might be able to know do you know which nerve comes out at which level in the C-spine? Do you know what muscles that innervates? And do you know uh, what, uh, like, what reflex that is or how to test that on exam? So they like to ask questions where you have to have a couple of different, you have to follow that along to know and get them all right to get the correct answer. So disc herniations, the nerve affecting above or below the, the um, vertebra, upper and lower extremities, sensory and motor nerve aff, um deficits and body in motion pathophysiology. So acute or chronic. So um, biomechanical stuff, baseball pitching, stingers, knee trauma, uh, like posterior lateral corner injury and what anatomy is injured. Uh, another nice thing is um, like for peds, a good question would be the way that their um, growth plates mature and at what age. So if you see an x-ray, do you know if that's a possible growth plate or a possible fracture? And how can you look at that? Okay. Pharmacology. So applications of medications for sport-related issues and its contraindications. So when should you use medicines? When should you not use medications? What are some sports that you can use some medications and not others? Pain, acetaminophen versus NSAIDs, steroids or controlled substances, 
Antibiotics and antivirals, they love to ask these types of questions when it comes to derm and wrestling. Duration of treatment, return to play recommendations. Consider sports specific tailoring like MRSA and herpes gladiatorum. Like, can they, can they return if you cover it or do they have to wait a certain number of time, like 48 to 72 hours after starting medication? Um, are we worried about advising a track athlete if they can be out in the sun or if they have to stay in the shade? Uh, diabetes medications, how to help manage that around competition and, and stress. Antihypertensives, which medications are best or disallowed for specific sports. So archery and shooting sports tend to disallow beta blockers. Uh, running, you want to be able to get your heart rate up. Asthma medications, intermittent versus persistence, and performance enhancing drugs. It's good to know if these are approved by WADA in or out of competition, or if they're always considered banned. And supplements, amino acids, caffeine, creatine, et cetera. Um, Post-exercise. Oh, did I jump onto your spots, Jason? Uh, that's fine. You can finish the slide. Go for it. You take over nutrition. Okay. Even though all I do is like to eat chocolate. But yeah, so post-exercise, nutrition, hydration. Um, I will say this, uh, not just for the nutrition slide, but guidelines, heavily cited guidelines, whether they're coming from ACSM, and the mature athlete, whether it's OBGYN and exercise in the pregnant athlete, the CAQ loves to reference these documents um, to ask a question or two. Chocolate milk, I always reference this because when I was a fellow 11 years ago, uh, we had about three journal clubs on the importance of chocolate milk as a post-hydration drink. Um, I don't know if it's as emphasized anymore, but that's just as an example. Diagnostics, you know, what imaging and labs to obtain and why? What is also the best first imaging to obtain and why? You can make the argument to always get an MRI for something, but it's not necessarily the best first imaging study to obtain. Fracture pans and treatment, as Dr. Rubesh talked about, for example, with uh, pediatrics, you know, obviously knowing your Salter Harris um, uh, fracture guidelines and Salter 1 and 2 should be non-ops, uh, you know, Salter Harris 4 is ops, Salter Harris 3 is kind of a, uh oh, that's a question mark in gray area, depending on where it is. CRPS, the phase and type 1 versus type 2, yes, you're going to have to go back and remember that even if it's just for this exam. Um, when are consultations appropriate? Aspiration analyses. If you like to aspirate that knee, you might have to remember more than just 50,000 above is considered septic. What does 30,000 mean? Um, what if there's a left shift? Things like that. Um, the difference between yellow and blue crystals. It's not just something for residency. You're going to have to remember what that means on an aspiration. Uh, spirometry and PFTs, asthma, COPD, is something have restrictive disease or not in the lungs? And this has actually become a little more pertinent, obviously, with COVID. Rhabdo is always a big one. And for some reason, I think I hear someone say every year they always get a question on foot strike hemolysis. I don't know why, but that's why I threw it down there. Um, obviously, acute management and on field treatment. Carla, you know, if is an athlete down, how do you treat them? What about heat and lightning? Obviously, if he went from watching the, the men's World Series on ESPN, ESPN2, flash to bang, it's 30 minutes every time. If, if a fan is down, not an athlete or a coach or an umpire or a, a, you know someone in the dugout or the field, but someone in the stands, what happens? c -spec, that's Kodiak, that's right. That's Melody. That's Dr. Melody. This is my seven-year-old uh, who loves Dr. Melody's dog, Kodiak. Um, and you know spinal cord injury and autonomic dysreflexia. For those of you that are not in PM&R and don't know what autonomic dysreflexia is, that's something that you're gonna have to be aware of at a minimum for the CAQ and if you want to take care of any para-athletes at all. From a team physician ethics, medical legal standpoint, there typically is always about one to three questions in this area, could be less, could be more. But the importance of communication algorithms and not just setting up as well as let's say how the Buffalo Bills did it with what happened last December, but in the off season, in the preseason, that's when the communication algorithm should be set up. Athletic training facility, aka training room. This is where you're going to uh, have to figure out common infectious diseases and how to treat them. Dr. Statuta actually gave a fantastic talk on skin and in, in the athletic training room facility. So that is a talk I would reference. Uh, Andy Meyer keeps posting all the talks on the MSM YouTube channel. I would strongly recommend viewing that one. I think it's from last fall. Um, 
return to play and clearance to play. And that could be for anything. That could be anything from mono to a concussion to coming back after a surgical procedure. Who is responsible in different situations for travel nationally, internationally, less than 18, greater than 18? Those are things you should be aware of. Mental health and wellness. Um, obviously, this is a very, very large topic, extremely important. But for the CAQ, you're going to have to know the basics. Understand what the next best steps are. If an athlete, if a, if a question is posed, <clears throat> then athlete admits to suicidal ideations or thoughts. What about pharmacology and uh, ADD, uh, or excuse me, ADHD? What about nutrition and someone is having difficulty keeping up with nutrition for various reasons, self-worth, all those things, there's appropriate algorithms that one needs to know for the CAQ as well as when you're practicing. So the way that the CAQ is done, just to, to give you a little background, is they have a blueprint. And the blueprint provides the percentage of questions out of the 200. So if you are the week before going, man, I'm getting worried, I'm not sure what to study, well, this would be a good way to know where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. Diagnosis, management, and treatment of sports-related injuries and conditions is 50% or 100 questions. Health promotion, remember I talked about those uh, highly cited evidence-based expert opinion guidelines, health promotion and prevention aspects of sports medicine. That's going to be, what is that? 25 questions, uh, 40 questions, excuse me. And then roll the team physician. If you feel like you're freaking out a couple of days for the exam, maybe you don't study that because that's only supposed to be two questions. So this is the blueprint that is followed to come up with the questions. Uh, Melody or Dr. Rubesh, I think we're back to you. So don't forget, there, there are usually one to three questions with ultrasound images. Again, we talked about layered questions where you have to know your anatomy, typical pathology in an area, and also maybe ideas like hypoechoic, hyperechoic, um, if something has bounce or something like that. Also, there could be one to two questions on orthobiologics. They try not to be controversial. They're like, you don't have to, if you're worried about them going into the weeds on things, if you have debates on this in clinic, they probably won't make that the question, but they do want to know that you have thought about it, that you know the basics, that you know what the evidence-based medicine is. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, just to make sure you would know how to advise your patients. And then, so also there's some really, really great resources. So, uh, I loved the CAQ study guide that AMSSM puts out. It has the CAQ questions. And then also each question has amazing, you learn so much from each, why each question, why each uh, answer was wrong. So that's a great one to, to get. And there's like six of those books now. Uh, the Finoff and Harris book, Sports Medicine, is in outline form. I found that really great because you can take notes in the um, in the margins and you can put other stuff into it. The O'Connor book, the ACSM Sports Medicine, a comprehensive review, it is truly comprehensive. And there is an updated edition that's going to be coming out soon, too late for these um, summer uh, test takers. But if you are preparing this for the 2024 year, it sh you, there should be a new edition. Um, it's very comprehensive. So if you're not sure why an answer is correct, or if you feel like you need a deeper dive into something, it's a great option for a comprehensive management. Oh, we're faster than we expected, Jason. Well, you know, we speak fast. So I want to make sure for those of you who maybe you're driving or on your phones, Andy Meyer was gracious enough to put the link uh, to buy the sixth edition if you weren't able to go to the annual meeting. Um, Andy put that in, as well as the link on the YouTube channel for the clearance for sport that uh, Dr. Daphne Scott, HSS, actually gave for Dr. Statuta. Then Dr. Statuta's talk on high yield medical topics in the training room, he put on also, and that has been, in, not because Sivan's one of my friends, really one of the best talks for a review that we've had, I'd say in a couple of years. So if only we know who moderated that. Oh yeah. I totally get partial credit. Oh, was that you? Oh, whatever. I, I um, got to introduce her. It was an honor. So uh, that said, again, the point of tonight's talk was to provide hopefully the, I hate saying it like this, the building blocks of the exam itself 
you guys have all worked really hard uh, this year. Um, so we just want to make sure we gave that to everybody. We felt that was really important because we don't want anybody to ever be ever get ding just because of the like logistics of things. With that, um, this is really informal. If anybody wants to ask questions, you can ask specific topics and either myself or Melody are more than happy to try to answer it um, about a subject area. Um, I can talk about, I, like I said, I recently just took it again for my research a year ago uh, and happy to answer questions about that. By all means, if you would like to uh, log off, welcome to log off. If you want to ask some questions and come, you know, turn off, Turn off, turn off your mute and uh, go on to video. We're all yours for the next little bit. Who is going to break the ice? So, oh, someone went up to chat. Okay, fine. We'll do it that way. What's a good resource for exercise fizz that's helpful or relevant for the CAQ? So my opinion is for what is needed for the CAQ, my personal opinion, and I didn't write a chapter in this book, so I have no financial aspects to it, is the, the Harrison Finoff text. That is for the, for the basics, for the formulas, that's really good. Uh, I can also tell you that the O'Connor text, they, I think there is a whole chapter on it, if I remember. And third, one of the CAQ talks with the AMSM slash ACSM annual series this year was on exercise phys and Dr. Heather Vincent gave that talk. I think that was through ACSM. Um, so we could always try to find slides for that. But yeah, Dr. O'Connor's chapter is probably a little bit more detail, whereas Dr. Harrison Finoff is more kind of, as Melody said, the, the bullet points, the, the bare bones of what you need to get through some of those questions. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Other questions? So uh, we can keep chatting until somebody wants to unmute. Um, but one thing that I noticed is like, they like to ask questions. Somebody comes in and they'll give a history and then they'll, you'll need to know what your kind of differential is. And then maybe they'll ask, what, is, what physical exam finding would you expect to be abnormal? And it's usually a named exam, like Hawkins or something like that. You know, another um, approach, and Grant, this is uh, what my fellowship director did 11, 12 years ago, something like that is use the IT exams that you took, whether it was July or January, February, or some fellowship directors will use old questions and, and actually give tests. My The fellowship I was in gave me quarterly tests. So I actually use those questions, which are older questions um, that probably have been retired, but also are helpful. If you're someone who likes to, to do questions instead of just reading, that's another approach as well. Um, but take advantage of the fact that you had to take an exam last July. You had to take a practice exam in January, February. Um, those are written by AMSM members. And they're, I would say they're close to the level of difficulty, sometimes more difficult than the actual true board exam or CAQ exam itself. And also keep in mind that the new concussion guidelines just came out last week. So they probably stuck to pretty basic things for this year in terms of um, diagnosis and return to play guidelines. I mean, a lot of that is core and foundational and didn't change. But if you think you're, if you're trying to, again, pull your hair out about something that seems to be splitting hairs, you probably don't need to be spending that much time on it if you're trying to play the odds. I would say in my opinion that this exam is probably the most straightforward exam of all of the exams since step one that I've had to take. Uh, so for me, it'd be step one, step two, and whatever we're calling step three now. And then for me, the APMR written boards and oral boards, the, the CAQ for sports was, it, it, it is not, you're not going to have a paragraph or a, you know, this long. It, it's going to introduce something and it's basically, do you know it or not? There, there might be a couple of questions where you think there could be two answers. Again, it's the best answer. Uh, like I used an example before, you could always make an argument like an imaging test to get an MRI, but that's typically not the first thing you do, um, depending on what the presentation is. Let me see what this next comment is. Have we found that there are IT questions on the actual boards? 
Um, if there are, I can't comment on that and or I don't remember. Uh, Dr. Rubesh, anything from your side or perspective? Yeah, I feel like that's probably avoided quite carefully. Yeah. So I have a question on uh, some content. Um, so sure. uh, with regards to um, uh, things like periodization and uh, the various types of it, the different cycles within it, and then also um, sports specific kind of rehabilitation um, type programs like for throwers, et cetera. Can you speak at all towards those two topics and how much detail the uh, questions might go into. So, so just so everyone's aware, Dr. Rubish and I don't write exam questions for the board. Otherwise, we couldn't actually be given this lecture because it'd be a conflict of interest. But um, with respect to Palmer, to your question, what I have seen is understanding the stages. Stage one after an injury, let's say it's not surgery, let's say it's bad ankle sprain. Stage one is immobilization. It's ice control the swelling. Stage two is begin mobilization, range of motion, then you go to strength, then depending on the extent of the injury, you're going from concentric to eccentric, um, or maybe some other, you know, open chain, closed chain, depending on what sort of injury it is, and if it's surgical or not. And then there's a return to sport. So there's a kind of an algorithm, uh, kind of a 10,000 foot view approach to it. There's actually a really a couple of nice manuscripts. Kevin Wilk was uh, the lead author, this was from a throwing perspective, was in the PMR journal, I think in 2016, maybe. But there is a there is a typical way that one is going to expect that you should progress after an injury, a musculoskeletal injury, whether it's operatively or non-operatively. Um, the other thing to be aware of is clearance after a surgical injury needs to be done by the surgeon if you're the lead team physician as a non-operative person, but also knowing that some of the very basics is you always have to have full range of motion, you have to have full strength, and you can't be necessarily in pain, but the range of motion and strength are key. Um, Mel, any thoughts that you'd have? No, I think that was pretty good. Thank you. Uh, it does see. remind me, though, that they do like to ask about obscure sports like like don't neglect scuba diving. There's only a couple of things they'll ask, but you need to know that. Um, and yeah, th don't neglect any of the um, more kind of fringe sports like altitude, that kind of stuff. And, oh, Adrian yeah. has a question. Good question. What unit of measurement does the exam use uh, US versus metric in regards to altitude sickness, heat illness, for example? So if I remember correctly with regards to temperature, is I thought it was Fahrenheit, but they had a conversion, um, kind of like they do on USMLE, but I cannot actually remember that. Um, knowing, for example, like should a race be called and knowing the ACSM guidelines, if it's above, what was it, 85 to 82 degrees, 85? Oh gosh, I should know this off the top of my head, but you know, if there's a black flag out, but because in the United States and the ACSM, they published it in Fahrenheit, I believe it's fair game to put it into Fahrenheit and not Celsius if that answered that? I think they do them both. Okay. And then what was the second? Part? Oh, so altitude. Altitude, whether it is going down with scuba or going up with ski, snowboarding, whatever, those questions are probably seem to be the most difficult, um, unless maybe you're one of the fellows up in Minnesota or you're in Miami, Florida or San Diego. But I would say knowing the basics, knowing if you're at risk for, you know, what is one of the first things you should do? Get down to a lower level of altitude if you're developing altitude sickness. Knowing that, can you use a calcium channel blocker if it's going to affect your brain versus pulmonary aspects of things? Those are things that are really straightforward and they like to hit those points. Um, you know, what is the you know, how quickly should you rise, you know, to prevent the bends or if you get the bends, you know, things like that. Those, those really are the questions that they seem to ask at times. I can tell you the weirdest question I ever got was something about a hockey arena when everyone in the stand started uh, fainting. And I found out after the fact from talking to different people from around the country, it was basically a carbon monoxide question. That's all it was. So 
going back to the basics, I think sort of makes sense. Um, and that's where me personally seeing some of the bullet point stuff when I'm studying, especially as I'm getting closer to the exam has worked for me. Other people, you may like to read the full chapter. So that's where using the, the O'Connor book versus the Finoff and Harris text, that, that's dealer's choice. It just depends how you feel most comfortable doing it. Um, Dr. Rubesh, any thoughts on altitude, whether it's going north or south? Yeah, that does remind me. I think that one thing that um, it's most important to know about is more um, which medication or which, which medication type you would start. I don't remember there being a lot of differentiation questions about dosage. Do you, Jason? Like it's more you need to know which medicine, not like is it 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams? The only dose, I will say this, the only dosage ones that I remember you had to know was all the stinking skin lesions and wrestling. They love those questions. Is 120 hours? Is it 72? Is it 400 milligrams versus 100 milligrams? Like, so the wrestling, if you're going to study dosages, wrestling and derm, hit that as your one page for that. Um, any suggestions for high yield adaptive sport test content? Just the two textbooks. Um, so there, I would say there's, there will be an autonomic dysreflexia question yeah. on it. It's either going to be a boosting question or what level. So they'll tell you what level um, spinal cord injury it was. You need to know if it's above or below. Um, and you need to know what the symptoms would be. Like maybe they would say, maybe they kind of give it to you that somebody is boosting and they'd say, you know, above the level of the lesion or below the level of the lesion, will there be, you know, sweating or that kind of thing? Or what is the first thing you would do? Let's say it's unintentional boosting. What is the first thing you would do to try to relieve that, you know, to help them uh, start to get better? Um, to confirm was the O'Connor textbook you said was having a new edition so for full disclosure, I am the associate editor on the question book for the, for the, for the ACSM that will not be coming out until December of 24 or spring of 25. Is that the new O'Connor book isn't coming out until then? So that, that's a, it's a parallel The O'Connor book. So Fran is the lead editor for the chapters and there's the parallel question book that Brian Davis is the editor and I'm the associate for. So every chapter in the O'Connor book has 10 questions in the question book, they come out together. And I just got an email about another chapter about five minutes ago. <laughs> so, so yeah, so uh, for those of you who are planning on taking the test next month or in November, don't wait for another book to come out. What's out is out. Uh, let's see what's next here. Oh, just thank you. Cool. No problem. Other questions? Content, logistics, anything else? Oh, medical, legal, and communication. If you are the head team physician, you're responsible. Just so you know. That's going to be the answer. There's always going to be a HIPAA question. Don't divulge anything to the athletic director. To Remember, the athletic trainer is the end of the HIPAA chain. You and the athlete, if the athlete's under 18, the caregiver over 18, it's the athlete. You go very conservative on those HIPAA questions. You don't tell ESPN, the Ocho, what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, there's such a, there's such a emerging uh, understanding about mental health. So mental health first aid and all of those. So um, make sure that there's probably going to be some questions on not just first aid action plans, but mental health action plans and uh, what the next uh, appropriate management is. Uh, most of those are, if somebody approaches you, then you need to make sure they're safe first and foremost. You don't leave them alone. If you're worried about them, there needs to be a plan, all of that. And again, if you're looking for any um, manuscripts or documents, things to look out outside of the question book, I would say go to those very, very high yield um, consensus guidelines. AMSM has a bunch. ACSM has a bunch. Like I said, ACOG, uh, the American College of OBGYN, that usually the most up-to-date reference with regard to exercise in the pregnant athlete. Usually there's one question on that. 
Um, I cannot remember the J and C. Are they up to nine guideline nine now regarding hypertension? Um, that usually is going to have one question. Something from there will be one question. Um, Amsterdam will make it on. What was five again? Was that Paris? Whatever the fifth iteration was, I can't remember. Berlin. I think it was Berlin. There'll probably be something in that where the important uh, concept at that point was the integration more and more of this vestibular rehabilitation. That is now fair game. Um, there would be nothing political. I know there's been a lot of challenges from an endocrine, transgender. Remember, your job as physicians is take care of the patient. Don't let any political stuff come in. Um, I doubt they would do that, but I know there's been some challenges more and more with uh, patients in that genre. Your job as a doctor, take care of the patient, period, end of story. But again, as Melody said, similar to orthobiologics, anything controversial probably will not be on the exam. So will there be a fair amount of COVID-related recovery guidelines? 30 or 40 questions. 50% <laughs> um, of the test. So the only good, consistent, no, that I'm saying this wrong. The consistently cited reference came out of BJSM and the importance of exercise, but low impact exercise. I think it was, Melly, help me. I think it was Bob Salas had it come out like a year or two ago. And the importance of low impact exercise to reduce the effects of long COVID. That might be fair game. Uh, in terms of an actual return to play, like 17 days or 24 days, I don't know if that would actually be fair because things have changed so much from the Delta variant to now the various, you know, uh, uh, Omicron variants. So I don't know if that's fair, but there is data that consistently has shown low impact exercise can be helpful. Um, but I think the, the, and this was something like Bob Salas, BGSM, I feel like it was a year or two ago. It was something like, he had like 40,000 people in this. It was an amazing manuscript and it was heavily, heavily cited. I think it made it into, you know, kind of the, the mainstream news about this. Um, so, oh, is this it? Andy, did you get it on there? Yeah. Yeah, also so physical, yeah, perfect. Awesome. Andy put it on. So that is one of these type of manuscripts that you should be aware of because it is such a well-done study in, in the second highest impact factor sports journal behind the just sports medicine journal is BJSM. So things like that. Um, so yeah, thank you, Andy. Yeah, at the same time, though, there might be one question. So trying to find the the impact paper, read it, do all that stuff, I would say it's probably not the highest yield time. Um, definitely know that as part of your fellowship and to take care of your patients. But if you're trying to figure out how to pass the test, make sure you know your anatomy, make sure you know your neurology, make sure you know if something is broken, if it's a fracture versus a growth plate. I have a question um, regarding the Bethesda guidelines. It's a pretty heavy article. Yeah, Any I remember. <laughs> recommendations of kind of how to maneuver that? There's just so many different points. Um, I think if you want to peruse it and kind of look at the highlights of it, but you're not studying it from the context of a, as a cardiology fellow. So I think understand some of the basics. I think the JNC guidelines with hypertension always seems to be you know, what actually is hypertension stage one. And then use that, I've seen it um, in the context of, okay, you're at a physical, you have a 16 year old offensive lineman and they are 141 over 78. Based on these guidelines, are they hypertensive? And if so, what is next step? follow up in one week of the white coat syndrome? Do they need to be held out a month? Do they need a further workup like that? I've seen those questions with the blood pressure and in your kind of pre-collegiate athlete. Um, that's how I've seen it. So that's how I would probably approach it. Cause I, yeah, I remember that documents like 40 pages or something like that. Um, I don't know, Mel, what, or Dr. Rubesh, what do you, what do you think? You're on mute. Yeah. I stopped listening when you said Bethesda guidelines. <laughs> giving you giving you memories from years ago yeah yeah all so right yeah, yeah that's how i approach it i'd use it in the context of what is hypertension now based on age 
And then what is the return to play guidelines or what is the clearance guidelines with, uh, with physicals? Oh yeah, that leads to then ECGs. Did you have an ECG question last year, Jason? Um, yeah, but I just guessed on those three questions. Was it a picture of an ECG or did they tell you what the findings were and you needed to? Yes. Yeah, I had two or three and I'm probably, don't let Dr. If anyone's a UW fellow, don't tell Dr. Dresner or Dr. Harmon this, but um, I tried to quite honestly just memorize like what's a J point again, because I don't do as many uh, ECGs where, where I practice. So, you know, what's a J point? What what does the delta wave mean? How do I treat that? So I tried to memorize that stuff and just look at some high yield. What's you know, uh, what was that? Mobits one versus two. I, I went over just the very very basics because I think max there was three questions on it. Now, if you're also at a fellowship where that's heavily emphasized, you may not need to go through that as much. If you're at a more of a, a musculoskeletal heavy fellowship then maybe you do want to go over that a little bit more but i didn't study the pictures as much except for the very excuse me the very high yield ones and on cue andy puts up the youtube from dr dresner and ecg interpretation we should hire him huh one of our very first fellows lectures going all the way back yeah Probably needs to be updated. I mean, so much has changed with the heart. I mean, now we have two hearts. The Apple Watch detects everything. I mean, um, we probably have time for a couple more minutes. Uh, if there's any more questions, we can go till about 9.15 or so, I think. Um, one thing that I think we should talk about, I think you mentioned it briefly, or it was in the slides about uh, schizophrenia and clearance and what you can what you can and can't do um, and clear them for, for sport now, which is different than when we first took this test. Yeah. So understand the up-to-date guidelines, which um, it goes without saying, understanding, and actually that kind of leads to another topic of what can you be cleared for with certain ailments, seizures, as an example. Are the seizures controlled or not controlled? Well, if you're a cross-country runner, that's very different than if you're a diver. If you're a diver and with a seizure disorder, you are not cleared. If you are a, basically if you're in water, you're not. If you are on the ground, you can be cleared. So there, there's different, different aspects, contact collision versus non-contact collision sport and you know certain ailments. Mono, it's 21 to 28 days. I don't know if it's 21 or 28 because I've never seen it consistent, but just know it's 21 to 28 days, <laughs> period, end of story. They're not going to give you like answer choices. A is 21 days and answer two is 28 days because that's not fair because it's not consistent in the in the literature. Um, single organ? Yeah, single organ. Um, and what restrictions uh, are required. So if you're a baseball player with, you know, one testicle, you should wear a cup, obviously, even if you're not the catcher. If you have a single kidney, can you play American football? You can, but just knowing the risk. So that sometimes I'll say, are you cleared? Or are you not cleared? You're cleared, but you have a discussion with the, the athlete and the caregiver if they're under 18, which is typically how they present the answer choices. So single organ. Um, if you are taking a certain medication that is required, um, uh, Melody alluded to this before, for example, uh, if you have to be on a beta blocker in a non-contact sport, well, can you do sprinting? Well, if you can't get your heart rate up, that might be something that is a no-go versus if you play softball and you play first base, you might be allowed to play. So obviously, I forget the name of the chart, um, I'm blanking, but basically there's an X and Y axis and it shows the uh, intensity and contact collision. And based on those things, whether you can have clearance or not, the intensity, uh, VO2 max, that, that I forgot the name of the chart, but it's something they allude to at different points um, when thinking about clearance. So uh, what else, Mel, are you thinking? Just wanted to make sure we talked about the single organ. Yep. Um, diabetes from the stamp type one, from the standpoint of how to manage their sugars, not so much the medication, but knowing that what should you have and when. 
Should there be a snack, a complex carbohydrate snack, snack excuse me, 30 minutes before um, or first thing in the morning based on when their practice or their event is? So that is something that's fair game. Um, return to sport after heat illness. Usually there's a grade return to play, obviously, um, but there's not a specific, you have to do A, B, C, D, but simply a graded return uh, guideline. Again, if you've had a heat illness or heat exertional illness. Um, concussions, I think it goes without saying. When in doubt, hold them out, that sort of thing. Uh, occasionally there'll be a question about ethics and there even sometimes is a question about like speaking to the media. <laughs> don't speak, the answer is don't speak to the media. <laughs> we refer you to our athletic director is usually the answer or something like that or, or PR person. Um, I got nothing else that I can think of. Dr. Rubesh, anything else from the big brain? You know, I really, if you're, if you're struggling with the question, take a step back and think about if it sounds like an idiotic thing to do or not. So if they're like, usually they'll, there's a couple gimmies where you can just remove one or two of the possible answer choices right away. That just is like, oh, you don't know this person and they're insisting on running. And I guess it's okay for them to run, you know, when you're worried about a stress fracture. So the, the answer is always like Jason said, when in doubt, hold them out or also be cautious and get more information. So high risk injuries like stress fractures, anterior tibial stress fractures, uh, you know, things that will, if you don't address them, will lead to surgery or early arthritis. Those are the like spondies. Um, stress fractures are a great way to ask questions, um, that kind of stuff. And, and a couple of things, the last thing I'll say, and the things that can really hurt someone in sports medicine, skiffies, uh, from a musculoskeletal standpoint, skiffies. So if you have a 11 year old kid with a traumatic knee pain, the answer should be check the hip. Um, acute compartment syndrome, know the anatomy as well as know that if you've got, you know, it's cold, it's tingly, pain off proportion exam, all that stuff after a recent fracture or a horrendous contusion, it's been four hours. The answer is go to the emergency room now that sort of thing. So the, the big stuff, you know, making sure there's not a, a, uh, superior tension side, um, femoral neck stress fracture kind of things that can really cause, um, imp impairments to an athlete long-term, uh, from an MSK standpoint. You know, um, did you have many hand questions? I feel like there's always a fracture question. Yeah. I think, you know, knowing your mallet finger versus your Jersey finger, knowing your boutonnieres deformity, um, Knowing your risk compartments, which I think uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, treatment for dequervins, tinnitus, and avitis. That always seems to be a question. I don't know why. Um, and it's associated with someone who was recently pregnant and with thyroid disease. Like that's the stem. Like that just seems to be the stem. Um, hold on. There's someone posted something. What percentage should you be scoring on? So there is nothing definitive official. But the lore has been, if you're getting 60% or better on the AMSM practice tests, you're fine. But can I say that with certainty? And can you hold me to it, even though this is being recorded? Absolutely not. This is what's just been kind of passed down over the years. So and I don't think anyone technically it's the knows. the fourth time you're taking the test, you should probably do better than that. Yes. If you're taking if you're getting a 70, you're going to destroy the test. So, yeah. If you're talking about the AMSM questions, the Finoff and Harris questions, the O'Connor questions, yeah, if you're talking about, I know there's one or two online sites like a QBank like, uh, I'd found it a year or two ago. Those questions weren't super great, I guess, in my personal opinion. Um, but if you're getting, you know, 60, 65%, you're doing fine. All right. So with that, it's everyone good much good luck on. yeah it's a good one then on uh because it's one i will have asked too <laughs> um good luck on your test definitely you know you guys got a couple of days left with your current if your current fellows with your fellowship team ask your program director apd if there's any last minute questions now's the time to do it uh, for those of you taking in two weeks much much good luck and you know we all hope to call each other have you guys, you know, call each other colleagues starting, you know, very soon. Have a good evening. 
and uh, good luck.